Okay, so now we're going to carry on with our assessment. Uh, we'll do just a couple functional tests at this point before we get into our palpation uh, assessment. So uh, this test here is a single leg stance test. Uh, you would have already done your gait assessment, I would assume, uh, but you may have a different order to your, to your exam. Dr. Michaud will be doing the gait assessment, so I know we're all going to tune into that portion of, uh, of this virtual summit, so I'm going to leave that aside for now. But you will do a gait assessment, identify some key areas, and then from there you'll go into a single leg stance test. This is a nice test um, just to see sort of the ease of performance. Are there any, is there any shaking or balance issues? Is there any gripping of the toes? This test gives us a, a window into the single limb stance phase of gait. And when we're walking, uh, we spend 60 to 70% of our time on one foot or the other. When we run, we're spending 100% of the time on one foot or the other, or we're airborne. So it's important for us to um, appreciate how this patient um, controls load or manages uh, forces when they are in that single limb stance phase. So again, a good test for uh, identifying people who might be prone to ankle strain sprains or a future predictor of low back pain. So it's a good test to do. It's fairly simple. Uh, we're just going to ask the patient to, as you're standing in place, go, uh, go ahead and put uh, lift one leg up off the floor. And here we want to look at, again, general ease of performance. Can they even stand on one leg? And, uh, and uh, what compensation efforts do they have in play if they do this incorrectly? So a good test would be the foot is quiet. We don't see a lot of activity in the extensor tendons. We don't see a lot of toe gripping. Uh, the leg, um, hip, knee, foot, ankle are fairly quiet. The torso is neutral places where we might see the patient fail. And if you need to switch legs, go ahead. Um, and obviously you're comparing side to side. So ask the patient, raise one leg up. Generally, uh, <laughs> so that, that's, a, that's a fail. So gripping of the toes, the foot kind of looking for a place to land, uh, kind of switching from pronation, supination, lots of extensor activation, the knee going into medial rotation. Um, if you're looking from the ground up, those are the kinds of things you'd be looking at. Uh, and then just sort of, it should be nice and quiet is how I like to, to kind of think about it. The other thing, if we move upwards toward the hip, um, <clears throat> is can they maintain a level pelvis or do they go into the classic Trendelenburg or that would be a compensated or a Trendelenburg where they drop, okay? So he's ex exaggerating this obviously, um, but uh, yeah, you wanna have the patient do that, compare side to side. Most patients, I'm not progressing them to eyes closed because many patients can't. Um, they, they'll fail the test with eyes open. So I don't know that we always have to go to that um, next step. Okay, and again, looking from the, the front and the back. So toe gripping, a lot of extensor tendon activity, uh, foot going pronation, supination, poor support, instability, um, rotation of the knee, uh, dropping of the hips into a Trendelenburg or a hiked hip uh, as with a compensated pattern, and uh, again, general ease of performance. So that's our single limb stance test. From there, you uh, I'll have you go ahead and turn around. You can do um, a simple uh, calf raise test, but with this, if they're really irritated and having pain or really in the acute stages, um, this might be too painful for them to do. So you will not do this test because it will just irritate them more. If they can do it, you can just have the patient go ahead and push up onto one foot, up onto the ball of your foot, and you're looking for, can they do this? And um, then comparing side to side and to the other side, they should be able to lower in a controlled manner to the floor, up onto the other side. And essentially what we're looking for here is symmetry. They should be able to get off the ground equally on both sides. And I suppose you could also use that as an endurance uh, test to see, uh, and we would assume the affected side, they would not be able to um, go into that um, plantar flexion and uh, would not be able to hold it as long. But again, if there's any symptoms reproduced with this, I would probably stay away from this test. You're gonna get the information you need as soon as you come in and palpate and they say, oh, so we may not need to subject them to more of that. And the third test that, uh, that we'll do is a step-down test. Now this, uh, this step is way high, higher than we need, um, but generally a six to eight inch step 
is enough. So I'll just let patients know I'm kind of a monkey see, monkey do uh, person. So I'm gonna do the test, I'll perform the test, um, and then uh, I'll ask the patient to do the same. And I'll let them know that I do wanna know if there's pain, but this isn't a pain provocation test. Um, and I'm just gonna watch them perform this test. And I'll do this several times on each side unless of course they have pain. So in this uh, test, I'm gonna have you put one foot in the center of the bench and I want you to go ahead and just do a little heel dip toward the floor. Good, and come on up. As with all these tests, you're gonna compare side to side. And what I'm looking for with this test, again, if we start at the foot and go up, we're looking for general uh, stability and motor control. Can they perform the test and perform it in a fairly quiet manner? Do they, uh, do they have any type of instability in the foot where it looks like that foot is sort of looking for a home? Is the knee dropping into valgosity or the hip uh, or the, um, uh, the femur medially rotating? And does the hip go ahead and uh, do a, a fail for me there? So just step down, knee will go and in, collapse into valgosity and hip shift, drop, torso rotation. And the other thing you're gonna see a lot is more of a knee strategy and not even much movement through the hip. So they do more of a, a shear down toward the floor where they don't even bring the hip into the equation. Why we look at this test is because if they aren't well supported through the core and the hip girdle, there will be more load placed through the lower extremity. So when it comes to management, not only are we going to treat the bullseye and um, do some exercises specific to the injured tissue, but we also need to look up the chain and, and really try to manage uh, the movement dysfunction as best we can because hip poor stability through the hip girdle is going to drive issues down through the foot and ankle. I think we can all appreciate that. Uh, the other thing is if we see a lot of uh, tendon um, uh, prominence, uh, we know that we, we can sort of start to wonder if the intrinsic foot muscles are doing their job. And that's one of the reasons where these, uh, the lower, lower leg muscles will start to over-engage and over-activate when we don't have good control through the intrinsic foot muscles. So again, when we get to some exercise, we'll bring that into our, our, um, our exercises as well. All right, and you can also look at this from, from the back, but for now, let's just have Tobin step down. So that's our general assessment in terms of our functional tests.